Okay, so yeah, this is going to be a slight kind of sidestep into science fiction, but hopefully not really. So I've had this pet theory for a while that science fiction and archaeology are actually kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, they both exist in this borderline between art and science. They're both fundamentally concerned with world building, and it's very much a material culture kind of aspects of that. You take a piece of material culture either from the contemporary or from past, and you extrapolate a plausible past or future. So no surprise then that there's been a long history of science fiction um, dealing with archaeology. Uh, the kind of lin linkage between the sort of ghost stories we've been hearing about and science fiction is, as I'm sure many of you know, H.P. Lovecraft, who tells his ghost stories, but he makes his monsters explicitly from outer space. Um, this is a quote from Mountains of Madness where he describes an ancient alien city in Antarctica very much in archaeological terms. Um, and from Lovecraft we get this rash of ancient alien stories um, that goes right up to the present day. Uh, these are just a few I could have illustrated an entire talk with, with many, many of these. Uh, very often these kind of include aspects of uh, fantasy, ghost stories, horror, a lot of the, the kind of folk horror um, elements that we're familiar with from things like M.R. James. So this is Doctor Who the Demons from 1971, which is a sort of quintessence of 1970s folk horror boiled down to five episodes of BBC Tea Time Serial. Uh, you have archaeologists digging up the devil in not Silbury Hill, honest, um, <laughs> except the devil is um, an alien because of science fiction. But what I'm actually going to talk about today is not the kind of obvious folk horror, soft science fiction stuff, but the hard science fiction. So for those of you not familiar with this term, this is the stuff that takes its starting point from scientific or technological ideas. Uh, that's really interested in uh, scientific accuracy, or at least the appearance of scientific accuracy, rather than things like plot, character, style. Um, and it's often written by scientists, so that's people like Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, Larry Niven. Um, and this contrasts with the kind of science fiction where the, the scientific elements are often just aesthetic trappings to tell a kind of more conventional story or a story based on other genres. What I'm particularly interested in are these what's called big dumb object stories. Um, there's a, a kind of rash of these, particularly in the 1970s, and they concern, um, as the kind of name suggests, what are sometimes called alien macro structures or mega structures, these vast inscrutable alien artifacts come landscapes that humans stumble upon or which stumble upon humans and they kind of concern human explorers trying to um, get to grips with these places. They're usually abandoned, they're incredibly enigmatic and these incredibly competent scientists will try and work out what makes them tick and usually what makes them tick relates to some big scientific what if that the author wants to address. So what I'm going to talk about mostly today is Arthur C. Clarke's Rendezvous with Rama, just because it's absolutely chock full of archaeological references. And that's about a, a large kind of uh, cylinder which invades the solar system, and inside it is this um, strange alien habitat which curves up on the inside. They're also known from cinema as well, so at the top there is Star Trek the Motion Picture. Um, I wanted to try and include a couple of clips from that, but if you've ever seen Star Trek the motion picture, you'll know it's not the world's most gif gifable um, film. Uh, I, I've included the, the spaceship from Alien as well, which is sort of borderline, it's a little bit small for an alien macro structure, but it is this kind of alien landscape come artifact which is explored. And I listened to the DVD commentary in um, kind of preparation of this, and they do say they wanted it to be much bigger if it had the budget, so I think that counts. Um, so kind of fundamentally exploring these abandoned alien relics is a kind of archaeological uh, pursuit. And Arthur C. Clarke, at least, is very keen to present it as this. Um, I'm going to put up lots of quotes here. I don't expect you to read them all. But here's one of many kind of sections of Rama where he compares uh, the exploration of this alien landscape come artifact with um, the excavation of the tomb of Tutankhamun. Uh, very often there are also archaeologists on the team. They're never the central figure because these authors are concerned with scientists, like proper scientists. But there's usually somebody who either is an archaeologist and they just kind of hover in the background, or one of the team will be like an archaeologist in their spare time. 
uh, which you even see into the ages. If you watch Star Trek The Next Generation, Captain Picard is a kind of closet archaeologist on the side, and that's it's straight out of Rendezvous with Rama, where the captain is a closet archaeologist, but there's also a real archaeologist back at base. So, um, exploring these, trying to uh, get to grips with these ever-present, absent alien creators is fundamentally an archaeological pursuit. Uh, archaeology is also invoked to kind of get a sense of the scale and the wonder of exploring these uh, landscapes. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke is quite fond of the word cyclopean, which has both archaeological resonances from places like Mycenae, but also Lovecraftian resonances. If you've ever read Lovecraft, it's one of his favourite words. Um, and these macro structures are really quite fun in a kind of processual archaeologist 1970s way in that they overlap between artifact, landscape and system. They are machines. You want to know what makes them tick and how the system works. But um, we're talking about hauntings and these are also haunted places. The, the kind of creators are ever present, but they're very rarely seen, at least not until the ill-advised sequels. Um, so here are several quotes from Rama where um, Clark talks about strange noises and haunted asteroids and the possibility of non-biological survival. Um, this is the culmination of Star Trek the Motion Picture where the kind of animating force of this strange macro structure is revealed and it is in fact something from their own past. It's the return of the Voyager probe from the 1970s. Spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen a 40-year-old <laughs> film. Um, what's kind of fun here is if you look at the way it's set out, it's kind of in the middle of a hinge. Um, so towards the end of these things, you get a kind of manifestation of this alien power that haunts and animates this strange object landscape. Uh, and this tends to deflect this very science-focused narrative in one of two ways. You either get a shift in genre, or you get a kind of act of transcendence. So genre shift is probably most obvious in something like Alien. The first 40 minutes or so, it's proper hard science fiction. You've got all these, well, they're not quite scientists, but they're reasonably competent people exploring um, an alien landscape. It's all very much like these 1970s novels, but then they disturb something, um, much like kind of, if you've read M.I. James' um, Whistle and I'll Come For You, they disturb something and then suddenly it's after them. Um, it becomes either a haunted house story in space or a slasher film in space, depending on uh, who you want to go with. Uh, here's another alien-related thing. On the left is Prometheus, which is a bad film. Um, <laughs> on the right is Doctor Who, Image of the Fendal, which is another kind of anthropological, archaeological-themed um, story. Both of these involve people communing with a severed head to gain information about the past, and then that's closely followed by a kind of manifestation of horrific, monstrous horrors. One of these is very much in the scientific vein, one of them is in the Lovecraftian Gothic, but they're essentially the same trope. And there, just for a bit of actual ancient content, is the still uh, prophesying severed head of Prometheus, so nothing new there. Um, so as has been pointed out before, this concern of these strange, unknowable, and um, alien uh, objects, which tell us about the kind of the small place of humanity in a vast, uncaring, indifferent, but wondrous cosmos. Um, it's all very scientific, but it's only really a, a kind of thin veneer of genre convention that separates that from what Lovecraft's doing and his um, vast, alien, unknowable horrors. So let's turn to the transcendence aspect. Uh, so at the end of Rama, um, the, the alien artifact does something that defies all human ability to understand it. I'm going to spoil another 40, 50 year old thing now. Um, it accelerates, uh, you, uh, I'm forgetting my science here, it accelerates beyond what physics says it should be able to do. Uh, reactionless drive, I think. I can't illustrate that, so instead I put up a bit of the Stargate sequence from 2001, the Space Odyssey, which is also from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, it doesn't have an alien macro structure, but it's doing very similar things. Um, so sometimes transcendence can also overlap with this kind of generic shift. So this again is the ending of Star Trek Motion Picture, where at the centre of this henge, 
uh, two of the en Enterprise crew kind of transcend, they become something more than human, but it's also presented as a kind of act of sacrifice. You have this strange act of sacrifice, self-sacrifice, transcendence in the middle of this weird alien henge. So, to finish, um, this kind of tradition of science fiction likes to present itself as very scientific, but it's also drawing um, either consciously or unconsciously on an awful lot of archaeological um, and kind of folklore horrific um, history. So it invokes archaeology uh, for the kind of theme of exploration, for the idea of wonder. Um, it wants to see, kind of tackle this from a kind of what we might think of as processualist, functionalist worldview, but it's also not um, unconcerned with the limits of this kind of scientific knowledge and dramatizing how it breaks down when actually confronted with something that's hard to understand in those terms. So in this respect, these stories are actually a lot closer to the kind of fantasy horror um, stories of M.I. James, H.P. Lovecraft, um, Algernon Blackwood, people like that, than they might appear on the surface. Archaeologically, they fit very well into the kind of 1970s, um, 1960s approach to archaeology, but also in kind of this concern with how these scientific approaches break down, they also prefigure um, a lot of the kind of postmodern processualist um, trends of the 80s and 90s in ways you might not necessarily expect from these authors. So thank you, that's what I've got to say.